Hey everyone, and welcome back to Ontario Cryptids. Thank you all so very much for your overwhelming response that I have received and I'm still receiving on my 100th episode. So thank you all so very much for viewing, liking, and commenting on that video. I also want to thank everyone for being civil and respectful with your comments. I will be addressing the first clip at the end of this video, where I'm going to be discussing some of your comments. I will also be sharing a lost transcript with you all today. So we're going to be getting back to sharing your experiences. I would like to warn you that uh, the transcript itself is probably going to be a little lengthy. So if you have an encounter that you would like to share, uh, I know of a great place for you to share your story with like-minded people. You can forward your encounters to ontariocryptids at gmail.com. I forgot to thank some people on my last video, so I'm going to be doing that today. If you're new to my channel, every fifth episode, I thank those who have commented regularly on my last five videos. So a special shout out goes out to Bender Bender, Chris Lumen, Diana Clark, and Jean. Thank you guys so very much for commenting and liking my previous five episodes. I will also like to welcome all the new subscribers this month. Welcome and thank you for supporting my channel. Okay, you know the drill. Go grab yourself a beverage and get cozy in your favorite spot and sit back and relax. All right, so the year is 1900, and we're going to Thomas Bay, Alaska. This is a manuscript that was written by Harry D. Culp, and it is titled The Strangest Story Ever Told. And I am guessing Alaska, at least this part, has not changed much from the 1900s. If you take a look, I see absolutely no civilization on this map whatsoever. So let's get to the story, because this will be a lengthy one. All right, so this is how this starts off. The writer of the story has been dead for several years now. At one time, back in the early 30s, he had this story written up and ready to send away. Something happened, and the manuscript was put into a box and forgotten. The story should be listed amongst the classic, for it occurs before anything was ever known about the hirsute homens, before anyone knew about these beings, anyone except for the natives, that is, and they have known all along. But no one listened until the 21st century. Dear readers, during the years, the devil's country story has been passed along by word of mouth so often that the details had become obscured. It was then a very pleasant surprise when Mother found the manuscript just a short time ago and gave it to me to read. I found it fascinating, and I was left with a feeling of curiosity. I wonder if any of your readers will be curious. I wonder. Well, I'll just let you wonder. Sincerely, Daughter of Harry D. Culp Chapter 1 the spring of 1900 found four men batching together in a shack at Wrangell, Alaska. All four were broke, as unusual with prospectors. As luck would have it, I was one of the four. For reasons which will be quite obvious, I will just call the other three John, Charlie, and Fred. Charlie came into the shack one night in April, all excited, and said, Fellows, I have been on a trail of an old Indian for the last month trying to get him to tell me where he picked up a piece of free gold quartz he has at his camp. I've never said anything about it before because I wanted to get the story from him first and today he spilled the beans. He told me to go up to Thomas Bay and camp on Patterson River on the right side. 
travel upstream for about eight miles and then turn to the high mountains. And after traveling about a mile and a half, I would find a lake shaped like a half moon. Plenty of stone like I found on a slide there, he said. Thomas Bay is known by Native Americans in Alaska as the Bay of Death. About 150 years ago, a slide down one of the mountains wiped out a village, killing over 500 of its inhabitants. Well, of course, a prospector is ready to stampede on a whisper of gold any place, and we were no exception to the rule. We all talked the matter over, and finally it was decided that we would run our faces for an outfit and send Charlie to look the prospect over. While he was gone, John, Fred, and myself would hustle work somewhere for another grub stake and to pay the old one off. The fore part of May, Charlie loaded his outfit into a canoe and, having favorable weather, left Wrangell for Thomas Bay, which lies northwesterly about 50 miles. He had three months' supply but was to come back any time sooner if he found anything. But if he didn't show up in that time, we were to put out a search for him. John and Fred took a contract to get out wood, and I got a job in Wrangell Sawmill. Things went along until the first part of June, when, on a Sunday in the late afternoon, we all being home, and in walks Charlie without a coat or hat, and looking as if he had been through hell. He didn't give us any greeting whatsoever. He just heaved a piece of quartz over into a corner of the room and said, Get me something to eat. I'm all in and want to rest. The fellows looked at it, and after he had eaten, he had turned in without telling us a thing about his trip. We pick up the piece of quartz and say, Boy, it sure was a pretty thing to look at for a prospector. It was shot through with gold flecks, just like a badly freckled-faced kid. We were excited. I'll say we were. Just before dark, we walked down to the beach to bring Charlie's outfit. He had come up to the shack with only the piece of quartz in his hand, but there wasn't a thing in the canoe except the oars. Not much sleep for us that night, but Charlie never stopped sawing wood. We had hard work getting Charlie up for breakfast the next morning, but when he did roll out, he just ate, bored a coat and a hat, and left the house without saying a word or even answering one question out of many put to him by us. All of us being excited and feeling ourselves worth a fortune did not go to work that day, but sat around the shack and passed that blame piece of rock back and forth to each other while we talked and waited for Charlie to come back and make his report. Believe me, we were anxious to hear it. Along in the afternoon, he came in and said, Fellows, the SS Drigo will be in on her way south early tomorrow morning. Can you give me enough money for my ticket to Seattle? I'm through with Alaska and never want to see it again. I'll tell you about my trip to Thomas Bay and where I found the quartz, but my advice to you is to forget about it. It will never do you any good and will only cause you a lot of mental and physical pain. If we were not partners, I would never open my lips about this trip or what I found. But if you promise never to mention my name in connection with what I tell you or mention the name of Thomas Bay to me again, I'll give you the straight of my experience up there. Judge for yourself as to my saneness, but this is the most astounding thing you ever heard and, as far as I'm concerned, is beyond me to reason it out. Don't ask any question to prolong my story any longer than it takes to tell it, as I want to leave Alaska and forget if I can. I will try to make the one telling plain enough. This is Charlie's story. The first night after leaving Wrangell found me in Ideal Cove. Next night, I reached Muddy River in time to make camp again. The third night, I hit Ruth Island in Thomas Bay. I spent the next day looking up Patterson River for a suitable place for a a good camp. 
which I found a quarter of a mile up from Tidewater on the right-hand side looking up the river. Broke camp on Ruth Island the next day and woke up to the place I picked out the day before. Put up my tent, packed up my outfit and left the canoe on the riverbank. The next day I spent cooking beans, cutting wood and making things comfortable for a long stay. As it looked like rain, I wanted to get things fixed to keep dry. It started to rain the next night and just kept it up for days. I lost track of time as each day was just like the one before. Had nothing to read, was all alone, couldn't do anything without getting soaked, and the roars of the river and wind through the timber just about drove me bugs, so I put in most of my time sleeping. Finally, the weather broke and I got out. Spent several days in trying to find the old Indian's Half Moon Lake, but couldn't get it spotted. I did find about two miles from camp up the river and about a mile from it, a lake shaped like the letter S. On the creek coming out from the lower end, I panned some pretty good colors, but as I figured, not enough to get excited about. Yet, an indication of gold in the country. Talk about a dead country, that is for sure. There doesn't seem to be any life there at all. You might spend all day in the timber without seeing a squirrel. I was getting sort of tired of beans, rice, and bacon, so I made up my mind that I would go over the ridge about eight miles east of the S Lake and get a few grouse, as I thought I could hear a few hooters up there when I was at the head of this lake. I left come the next morning, which was a fine sunny day. I took only the rifle with me, and when I came to the ridge, sure enough, there were a few grouse hooting. I shot two and had gotten them when I bagged another one, which fell down the ridge about a hundred yards before it hung up. While on my way down to pick it up, I found that piece of quartz. Up to that time, I had paid very little attention to what the country I was in looked like, as it was so heavily timbered and brushy. The formation didn't show up, and I had no tools with me to uncover it. The top of an old snag had broken off and had fallen, scraping the top moss and loose dirt for a space of about 8 feet wide and 18 to 20 feet long. Uncovering this quartz ledge, which is where I found this piece. This ledge was worked smooth by a glacier at one time. I couldn't find anything to break a piece off with, so I used the butt of my gun to get that piece. In doing so, I broke the stock of my gun, thus ruining it for further use. This didn't worry me any, as I knew there was no game in the country larger than grouse and damned few of them. My first thought was of the richness of the quartz and of you fellows and getting back to town to round you all up so we could get busy on it. After looking over and enjoying the feeling of knowing I had made a rich find, I covered the ledge up again with moss, limbs, and rotten chunk. Finishing that job, I thought I would climb the ridge directly over the ledge and get my landmark so I could come back to it again or tell you where it was if anything should happen to me. This I did climbing straight up over the ledge onto the ridge till I reached the top, which was about 600 feet above where I found the ledge. I looked below me and picked out a big tree with a bushy top, taller than the rest and about 50 feet to the right of the ledge. Looking over the top of this tree from where I stood, I could see out on Frederick Sound, Cape of the Straight Light, the point of Vanderput Spit, and turning a little to the left, I could see Sukhoi Island, Kodiak, from the mouth of the Wrangell Narrows. Satisfied with that, I turned half round to get back sight on some mountain peaks, and laying below me on the other side of the ridge from the ledge was the half-moon lake the Indian had told me about. Right there, fellows, I got the scare of my life. I hope to God I never see or go through the likes of it again. Swarming up the ridge towards me from the lake were the most hideous creatures. 
I couldn't call them anything but devils, as they were neither men nor monkeys, yet looked like both. They were entirely sexless, their bodies covered with long, coarse hair except for the scabs, and running sores had replaced it. Each one seemed to be reaching out for me and striving to be the first to get me. The air was full of their cries and the stench from their sores and bodies made me faint. I forgot my broken gun and tried to use it on the first ones, and then I threw it at them and turned and ran. God, how I did run. I could feel their hot breath on my back. Their long claw-like fingers scraped my back. The smell from their steaming, stinking bodies was making me sick, while the noises they made, yelling and screaming and breathing, drove me mad. Reason left me. How I reached a canoe or how I hung on to that piece of quartz is a mystery to me. When I came to, it was night, and I was lying in the bottom of my canoe, drifting between Thomas Bay and Suki Island, cold, hungry, and crazy for a drink of water. But only to satisfy that later urge, I started for Wrangle, and here I am. You no doubt think I'm either crazy or lying. All I can say is, there is the quartz. Never let me hear the name of Thomas Bay again, and for God's sake, help me get away tomorrow on that boat. So passed out Charlie from our lives. We put a story down as a fantasy caused by loneliness and morbid thought. A lot of you commented that this video are two hunters um, in camouflage. And so I wanted to cover this video again. I'm going to pause it right here for, let me see, right when they start. And here, they're coming in now. I'm going to pause it right when they get into the clearing, right? Okay, so I just quickly want to go over some of your comments. Um, not picking anybody um, in particular, just reading some out loud, at least the very first few. The first one is from David Turner. Uh, the first clip is her dad and brother bringing the big duffel bag to put all those decoys out in front of her and she saw an opportunity to pull a fast one that's uh the first one um mike g says the first video is definitely two hunters uh, let me just see if i can find another one yeah and toxic sunshine also says first video has to be two hunters. The movements and walking is too human-like. Okay, I'm just going to stop it right there. Again, I want to thank everybody for being very respectful with their comments. Um, and I want to say that obviously everybody has their own opinions. Everybody sees things differently. I do have to agree, though, that these fellas here are walking extremely upright, whether they're hairy creatures or two hunters. The thing that bothers me is their outfits are very, very tight to their bodies. You can actually see the guy's calf muscle. Uh, the first guy uh, that comes across here, look at his legs. Very, very tight. Unless, I don't know, is that boots sticking out funny like that? The other thing too is, are they not, uh, is it not mandatory or... Um, isn't it a law that in the States, because I'm guessing this turkey hunting was in the States, um, that they have to wear an orange vest? I know here in Canada, they definitely have to wear an orange vest when they're hunting during hunting season. And it doesn't make sense to be wearing what looks like to me a ghillie suit. This isn't, it doesn't even look like a camel, but I could be wrong. But again, the footage is very blurry. It's not very good. I did go onto her uh, website and I, again, her YouTube channel, and I again looked at the video. I read some of the comments and yes, there's a 50-50 split on her channel that it's hunters, not hunters. I can see everyone's point of view on this. My only concern is they're, if they are hunters, that's... I mean, they're putting their lives in their own hands if there's other hunters out there with them. 
the fact that they're not wearing any reflective orange outfits or have camel, a camel outfit on that has orange in it, uh, which is what you primarily see. So I guess uh, it's going to be out there whether these are two hunters or whether they are actual Bigfoots. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to leave it at I don't know. So uh, I guess the first clip is, is out there. Um, people are going to see it different ways and that's okay. Um, so I do want to thank you guys though for leaving your comments. I truly appreciated all the comments that were left. I also want to thank the Weird Tales podcast for um, leaving his comments. I also post this to my Reddit page and he left, he or she, I'm guessing it's a he, um, left a lengthy and very descriptive analysis as to why he thought uh, the turkey hunter video was fake along with the other three that I, the other two that I had posted. Um, so thank you again for your comment. I truly appreciated your uh, your intake there and uh, the time that it must have taken you to type that out and leave the links, etc. He also left me a link of uh, various other ones uh, that he feels are, are more compelling. Um, and I have seen most of them and maybe we'll get a chance to cover some of them in upcoming videos. So I might uh, here and there throw in a clip and we can talk about it. But that maybe that's something I add every five videos um, because this channel is primarily about me sharing your experiences and not so much about me looking at video clips of blob squatches um <laughs> you know to to put it in better terms because there are a lot of videos out there that it's very hard to tell what you're looking at a good example is this one here um but in any case i do want to thank every single one of you guys for coming out and checking out my 100th episode i really appreciate it and I am overwhelmed, like I stated previously, of the response that I got. I was not anticipating anything to, to the nature of what I've received. So thank you all so very much. I truly appreciate it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the first uh, story today. Thank you again to all the new subscribers so far this month. Uh, welcome. And I thank you for your support. I truly, truly appreciate it. So if any of you have a story that you would like to share, then please forward your encounter stories to OntarioCryptids at gmail.com. I would be honored to share your story on this channel. Again, everybody, thank you so much for listening until the end. I truly appreciate it. Please hit that like button on your way out and smash that subscribe button if you're new to my channel. Have a great weekend and I hope to see you all next week right here on Ontario Cryptids.